Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We have been working on this awesome whirlwind pinball machine that uh, we bought off of an operator several years ago. We've been getting it back on its legs, so to speak. Literally, I guess. And on the previous video, we worked on the play field a little bit. It was very dirty. Had some problems with ramps and things, so we needed to order some parts. We got those in, got a lot of that put together. Got a lot of bulbs and stuff that we haven't swapped yet, but um, we couldn't even test play it or anything with the way the play field was. So we wanted to do that first. It's kind of a preliminary thing, but today what we're going to do is work on some of the boards. Now you can see the game is up and running. Um, but, you know, we need to do a lot of preventative maintenance to it. Probably hasn't been worked on in quite a while. So the very first thing I think that we're going to do is we're going to address this power supply here. So this is the original System 11 power supply from the factory. They make new ones of these, I believe, but this one's working great. Um, it probably just needs a little freshening up. So mainly that's going to entail uh, making sure connectors are all right, they look like they are, and cleaning fuses and replacing capacitors. And we're going to do that just so we know that we've got a nice solid power supply with, with um, this working the way it's supposed to. And then we'll go from there. One of the things that I see that's wrong with it, or the two, two things that we're looking at right now. One is the display has a couple digits out, or not digits, uh, segments out. If you look, one of the diagonal segments, I think it's either one or two of them, um, isn't working right. And then... Um, also, Joey said he hasn't seen the fan up top work yet, so we might that may not be working. We'll figure that all out. But the first thing we're going to do is mess with the power supply. So I'm going to turn it off. We're going to pull that out of the machine, and we'll uh, freshen that up a little bit to make sure we got a nice solid base to build the rest of the game off of. So here is the power supply. It has a transformer in the bottom of the machine uh, that creates various AC voltages, and then it comes up here and it's turned into other voltages by this power supply. Um, the 9.8 volt, I believe, is the general illumination coming through. You wouldn't think it would run off 9, but I guess I should look on the schematics to see. This section here is running the voltages for the displays. This capacitor here and this are creating the 5 volt. So this capacitor basically is like a filter capacitor. And then these smaller caps you sometimes have problems with too. So we're just going to replace everything. I believe I've got all of those in stock. And uh, the reason that you replace the capacitors is because they wear out, basically. And these are old, if you think about it. I think this game was 89 or 90, something like that. So uh, they've been in here a while, and it doesn't look like they've ever been replaced. Those are the originals, I would assume. It kind of looks like this operator just ran this thing until the ramp broke and then put it in storage so <laughs> it doesn't look like it's had much repair done to it. I, I will note though that this uh, power supply only had two screws holding it in um, so a couple of them were missing so they probably swapped it out of another game or something at some point. So let's see what caps I've got in stock and if I can get them all replaced. Alright so we were able to replace the four smaller ones and then the large one, the 18,000 microfarad, 25 volt. Um, now on these, uh, you'll notice whenever you take them apart that about half of them are 105 degree and about half of them are 85 degree. So don't get all too concerned about having to have them all 105. Um, and then we got down to these two glass fuses here are in pretty rough shape. So I'm just going to swap those with new ones. And, interestingly enough, these two capacitors here that are used in the display section aren't marked. They're just blue caps. There's no markings at all on them. Super, super generic. Or it could be that it faded or something. I don't know. I've never seen one that really faded. But um, I'm pretty sure they're 100 micro... microfarad? 160 volt. So I'm going to look it up on the schematics just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And that's why I have a whole bunch of them. Um because I run into this all the time. <laughs> but usually they're marked, so we'll see. Um, I also resoldered the connectors 
just to make sure that we didn't have any bad solder joints on the uh, edge there. So we got it nice and solid now. Um, and it looks like they did replace this resistor at one time. It must have had some kind of display problem. But it wouldn't cause our problem with the segment missing. This is just the voltage that runs the display. So if you can see the display, the voltage is at least close to what it's supposed to be. And we can certainly see the display. So I'm going to check to make sure these. I'm correct on the values of these. And then we're going to put two new fuses in it. And this thing will be ready to go back in. There's really not a lot to it, especially if it's already working. All right, so here is the schematic. And that is the capacitor in question. And you can see that it is, in fact, a 100. And there's the other one. It's the same on all of their stuff. I think from the System 3 all the way up. I don't know about the WPC stuff, but I guess they changed it eventually. But um, System 3 through System 11, it's the same capacitor, I believe. That's why I got a whole bag of them. <laughs> so I'm going to pop those on, and then uh, we'll put the power supply back in and I guess test some voltages to make sure everything's within spec or close to it. All right, so we've got it mounted back in the machine. Game is back up and running, so I'm going to check the few little... Uh, voltages that we have here. So we've got a negative 12. I think that's unregulated, which would explain why it's nowhere near negative 12. <laughs> and then we have a positive 12. 12.09. We've got a 5 volt, which is, look at this one, 4.999. It probably is 9999999999. It probably goes on to infinity. And then these are, like this one says, pos plus 100. You can kind of just check it on the fuse. 102.4 and then this one is negative 100 negative 101.2 so that's all pretty good so our power supply seems to be working just fine and it has all new capacitors and everything so hopefully it will work just fine for quite a while so I think for the that's kind of the only preventative thing I like to do you know there's caps on other things too like down here um, and maybe on the soundboard it would be a good idea. But I think now we're to the point where we need to just kind of troubleshoot everything. So I, one thing that's bugging me is this display. So you can see this diagonal piece here from the center to the bottom right is missing. That's why you don't have any R's. Um, but I think that's the only one. However, I think whenever we first turned it on, there were two missing. So I'm going to try to put it in test mode, and we'll see if we can get something on the screen where we can tell if there's one or two missing, and then we'll see if we can fix that or if the display is screwed up or what the deal is. So we're in display test. I don't know if you can see it. It's just on the top, and it's the, the bottom diagonal is missing. We just went past it there. See it? Just on the top, the bottom's fine. Um, so we need to look at that and see if that's a separate signal for the top and the bottom or not. That could be the display or it could just be the signal to the display. Sometimes it's just a bad connection on this ribbon cable. But we'll look in the schematics to see if we can track it down. Yep, just that one. All right, so in the schematic, it shows you that that is segment N. So segment N is not working on just the top display. All right, so if you look at this, this is display one, and segment N is right here. And then if you look down on display two, um, it has a separate segment in, so they, they keep it seg separate. And the little dash by each segment number uh, delineates the difference. So this is the ribbon cable coming in over here. And you can see that N has its own signal. And the second N has its own signal too. So it is a separate signal. So what all that means is if you have a problem with this ribbon cable you would lose just you could possibly lose just one segment on the top display but not lose the same segment on the bottom display because it's actually a different segment. It's N dash instead of N or N apostrophe whatever it is. Um, so 
I'm going to turn the machine off. And if you do this, always do it with the machine off. You don't want to unplug this ribbon cable while the machine's running because you can fry chips. So I'm going to try just simply unplugging the ribbon cable on both ends and plugging it back in and see if we get that segment back. Hopefully. Okay, so reseating the ribbon cable didn't do anything. So if you look, see how this says pin U9, the chip U9, pin 7 and pin 6 are the two uh, that it runs, that signal runs through. Right, and this is a 4049 chip. So what I'm going to do is I want to check with a logic probe to see if we've got the signal on the display. We're trying to figure out if the problem is on the uh, CPU board or if it's on the display board. So it, on the display we should have a signal at pin 7 and pin 6 um, because that segment should be displaying right now. Uh, so we need to find U9 on the board. So this is looking at the front of the board. J3 is the connector, the ribbon cable connector, and U9 is just below it along with U7. So pin 7 and pin 6 um, it would be there. So if you, what you need to know is where the first pin is and it's right there. You know, standard on that series of chip. So we need to count down to pin 7 and pin 6 on it, but the whole thing's upside down, so we kind of need to do it backwards. So if we're looking at the back of it, if we're looking, if we're standing here looking at this, it's the chip on the right, just below it, on the, just below it on the right side, and pin 1 um, is oriented pretty close to the edge of the ribbon cable, um, but will be on the back. So here's the ribbon cable. This is the chip. That's pin one. So as you count this way, it counts up to pin six and seven or what we're looking at. Now, the logic probe, since we're messing with the back of the board, there's nowhere to really clip the logic probe. So in a pinch, this isn't the best way to do it, but it can be done. Um, this whole board, this whole system is full of test points and everything's tied together. So for instance, the five volts on here is coming from the power supply. So I have simply hooked up my logic probe on the power supply. So I put the, the black, black lead on the ground on the power supply and the red lead on the five on the power supply. The better way to do it would be to hook it up to the board that you're actually testing, but most people test them uh, on the bench. Since we're testing it in the system, you can get away with doing this. So I've got it hooked up to our five volts this is the correct chip. We're going to check pin 7 and pin 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ooh. Pin 6 has a signal. And pin 7 has a signal. So that means the board itself actually is getting the signal. But the display isn't displaying the signal. So let's see if there's anything else it could be. Or if uh, it might be a bad solder joint on the display or something. So the next place it goes is uh, to this 7180 chip and it comes in at pin 7 and it goes out at pin 12 and then goes to the display. But the problem is that chip runs off of like 100 volts so you can't test it with your logic probe, it'll fry the thing. Um, but So if you look down here and find another 7180, yeah, see these things run off negative 100 volts. You could do it with a scope, though. Um, hmm. Let's look at the connect. Let's look at the resistors, and let's look at where the pin goes into the display. So our N is uh, pin twelve here. So it's R thirty six and pin 86 on the display. <laughs> so if there's a problem with either one of those, it would also be it. And it could be this chip's bad, but we don't have an easy way to test it without breaking out the scope. All right, so the signal goes through that and then it runs through a resistor over here and to the pin on the display. And all of that looks fine, at least from the back. So what I'm gonna do is that chip, the 7180, that runs off a negative 100, I'm just gonna check it with like a transistor test, basically. So you've, you're basically testing the gate inside the chip just to make sure there's not like a dead short or, a, or an open or something. 
So the way you do it is you can put, you kind of have to mess around with it a little bit, but I'm going to put my positive lead on pin 10. Or is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, pin 9. And the reason I'm doing that is because I can tell by looking at it that that's one of the, it's either the voltage or the ground, just the way it's bust. And then I'm going to compare measurements on the other pins. So it looks like all of the inputs are on one side and all the outputs are on the other side. So if that's pin 1, it's 0.6. So that's a gate. You know, it's between 0.4 and 0.7. If you move to pin 2, you get a similar reading. Pin 3, similar reading. So we're going through, and the one that we're concerned with is pin 7, which is our signal for that one segment. Now we're turned off now, by the way. Okay, so pin 7 reads the same as the other inputs. So all eight of those read about the same. Now, if we come up here, I don't know if this one will work or what. Sometimes you have to switch them until you figure out which one does it. Basically, all you're trying to do is compare it to the other pins. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, um, 9, 10, pin 11, 0.6 on the output, pin 12, 0.6 on the output. I think that's the one that, that uh, we're concerned with. 13.6. So, they're all, they're all the same. So, that doesn't necessarily mean that that chip's good, but it's a fair indicator that it's likely good. There's nothing obviously different about that pin. So it still could be the chip, but mm, it's probably the display. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the display loose, and then we're going to look at it very carefully and see if we can like see any kind of physical damage to it where that little connector on, I mean that little segment on the plasma is burnt up or something. All right. So if you look, it's the eighth pin from this end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it looks just fine. And you know. I don't see anything obviously burn up. You couldn't fix it anyway if it was. Um, but this display is just bad, unfortunately. It's a minor thing, and you know, you could play it like that because you can still read it. It's just, it's not quite right. So, we're going to have to put a new display in it. So, uh, what we usually do and what we're going to do this time is you can get a display kit where you put it together yourself, an LED display kit from Wolfpack Tech. Wolfpack Tech technologies. They make some really cool ones that you build yourself. Now to make a cool video putting that thing together. Uh, so I ordered that. We'll get it in. I think it was $159 free shipping even. So we'll see what happens when that comes in. But it's the board, all the chips that it needs to run, and enough LED segments to recreate this in LED, which is more reliable and long term. It's kind of the only solution because you can't get these displays new anymore. Um, so eventually all of them are going to be swapped over to LED and then eventually somebody will probably figure out a way to make these plasmas affordable again and then we'll swap them all back to plasma. <laughs> but if you have the LED displays you don't need the plus 100 and minus 100 voltage that we were just messing with on the power supply. Um, but we'll wait till that gets back in. I'm going to go ahead and mount this back in for now though so that as we test things we can at least read what the screen's saying. But new display on the way. All right, so we've got it back together. This thing, you know, it's got a lot going on. So I think next we'll test the solenoids um, to see if we can get the fan to work that Joe said he has not seen work yet. So I'm in solenoid test. It says, now I can't completely read it because it's screwed up, you know. Bottom right. A one, okay, it's saying flasher, bottom right, seaside. So I guess maybe this. Let's run through some of them. Trough, spinner. Some of those are not working. fan is working. Out hole, trough.
top right eject. Okay, so we've got several things here that are not working. Though. So we're going to have to go through them one by one. Let me try to write down the ones that don't appear to be working and then we'll see if we can figure out what they have in common or systematically try to repair them. All right, so here's my list, and it actually makes a lot of sense. You just can't read it because I wrote it in code. Okay, so you know I was catching them as it went through, so they're all out of order too. So uh, the trough, which is 0502, the A side does not work. And then if you look, there's one flasher at the spinner, which is the C side of that one, and that also doesn't work. And then there's one flasher on the bottom right that is the C side of 0501. It doesn't work. <laughs> and then there's the out hole, which is the A side of 0501. It doesn't work. So if you look, there's an A side and a C side to several of the solenoids. And so 0501, neither side works. 0502, neither side works. And then 0505, the A side doesn't work, which is the top right eject, and the C side does not work, which is two flashers on the bottom jet or something. Okay, and then a, uh, 0508, we'll skip this one for now. 0508, the A side is the top single drop target, it will not work. And 0508, the C side is the two flashers, whatever this saw is. Okay, so what you've really got is 0501, neither side works, 0502, neither side works, 0505, neither side works, and 0508, neither side works. But then you've got 0506, which is one flasher. The C side, whenever it triggers, it triggers the knocker instead. The knocker is the A side of 0506. So all of that actually makes a little bit of sense. You can kind of tell what's going on if you look at the schematics. So here is the schematic. So the reason there is an A side and a C side is because there is a little, basically there's a little relay in there that can switch the power to one side or the other, or the ground to one side or the other. Okay, and it, by doing that, it allows them to put twice as many solenoids in. Now they only used it on eight in this example, but you get the point. So one transistor on the board controls two different solenoids depending on which side is grounded or it may be vice versa they may be running the power to the other side but whatever so the kicker and the bottom right flasher are on the same um, one well neither one of those is working so there's probably something with this line which means there's probably something wrong with the transistor on the board that's running it and so all the ones that are doing that uh, where both of them don't work there's probably either a bad connection or there's a problem with the transistor that runs both of them right, because that's the, the common denominator. But then you get down here to the, uh, which one was it? This one, the knocker. So it runs the knocker on one side, and that works fine. But then it also, whenever it does the ramp bottom, you also hear the knocker. So what's going on there? Well, it may be that this diode's bad right here. If that diode was bad, depending on which side has the power, I guess, um, it could feed through and make the knocker happen when the flasher is happening. So it looks like all of our problems are bad transistors on the main board with the exception of maybe a diode for the knocker and the ramp bottom flasher. So I think maybe we'll look at this area first and see if we can figure it out and see if we can actually find a diode that's screwed up. All right, now upon further looking at the schematics, uh, there's a couple things going on. So we looked at the knocker. This fires when this fires. So I was thinking maybe that diode's messed up. So, But it wouldn't really do that because they get their power on the other side of it. All the board is doing is grounding it. So either the power over here is switched on or the power over here is switched on, which is done by the A and C select relay. Now, strangely, these are working. So seven, six, four, and three um, all work, with the exception of the knocker also fires whenever that works. Okay, these four all work. And the knocker fires by itself whenever it's supposed to in the test. So all of this is kind of working. So I'm, we're, we're trying to figure this out. 
All four of these do not work, which is strange. So this this there's a different voltage here. So it's 25 volts running these. So that's 25 volts and that's 25 volts. And then when it gets down here, that same 25 volts is running these four and they all work. Except for that one makes the knocker fire as well. So something weird going on there. And then these four are driven by 50 volts actually, a different circuit. And um, all of those work. So, hmm. That's kind of interesting that it's divided up like that. All right, so I'm going to look around. I'm going to look at connections. I'm going to look at fuses. Um, these are all working, so I guess that's fine. But none of these are working, and none of these are working. But if these aren't working, why are these working? It's just, it seems too coincidental to, to be you know, four bad transistors, it, something weird going on. So, okay, I'm going to look at that a little bit more and see if I see anything obvious. All right, so looking on the board, the fuse that feeds these four is blown. So one of those four may be locked on or something or screwed up. Um, so that's that. Now, these four were also not working, but it could be that their flashers and the bulbs are just burnt out. We haven't replaced all of the bulbs yet. Uh, they're also on the ramps or some of them are, so it could be that uh, we didn't get the ramps plugged back in whenever we swapped the ramps. So, let me swap a new fuse in and we'll go from there. But we still have our knocker problem, we'll figure that out. All right, so with the, um, with all of the bulbs replaced, it's obvious that what's going on is the C side is never coming on. So it's playing the A and the C side is the same coil. So our, our little relay that switches from A to C, which I believe is this one, is not working. So we got to figure out what's going on with that. All right, so if you trace back through the schematics, the solenoid 12 is the line that turns on the AC uh, relay. And it is controlled by Q8 in the back box. So I'll show you a little trick where you can check some stuff. This is going to be a love-hate thing. Some of you will love this, some of you will hate this. So on the bottom of the board are little transistors. These are all your solenoid drives. If you ground the tab of those, it makes the solenoid fire. So that's the trough. That's the kicker over on the left. That's the knocker. One of the pop bumpers, one of the pop bumpers. And this is Q8. This should be turning on this relay. And it's not. I'm directly shorting it by doing that. So even if that transistor is bad, it will turn on that relay. Even if the chips that drive the transistor are bad, it will turn on that relay, but it's not turning on the relay. So it's gotta be a wiring problem or the relay is bad. So, hmm, I think maybe, I think we're, the wiring all looks fine. I think maybe we're to the point where we pull this board out and do a little re-soldering. It could be that there's a, you know, a messed up connection on one of the pins or the relay itself, the coil could be burnt up or whatever, but that's just not coming on at all. And I don't know that it ever was <coughs> because, um, that one side, every one of those is a flash bulb, and I didn't see any of these flashers work. These three back here work, um, but they're on a different part of the, they have their own dedicated um, drives. They don't, they don't use that AC thing. Okay, so maybe we pull this board out and get a look at that relay. So here's the back of the board. Someone has replaced that relay at some point, or at least resoldered it. So these two connections are your coil wires. You can measure across that and see if they're connected. They should have some kind of ohm measurement because you're just measuring the coil, which is just a big circle of, or a big loop of wire. Um, hmm. You have the diode here across them, and then you have the 
two sets of switches basically. So when the coil's off, two things are connected. When the coil goes that way, two other things are connected. Uh, I never saw that move. So I think that coil might be bad. So I'm going to see if I can test it on the board or if I need to remove it. So it's it's measuring 1.4 meg ohms, which is really high. So that's probably, we're just measuring the diode that's on the board across it there. Let's see if I can get it to do it again. 1.5 meg. I mean, you're not going to have a coil with that much resistance on it. There's no way. Maybe 1.5K, but even that would be really high. So, um, that coil is probably screwed up. So let me take the relay off the board, and we might be able to take it apart, and there may be a broken wire or something where we can t see something obvious. Um, there's another thing going on, too, where it's a 24-volt coil, but it looks like they've got 48 volts running to it, so we need to kind of look into that, too. All right, so with the relay completely removed, we're still getting the same reading on the board. So basically, we were not reading across the coil. If we measure the coil here now, there it's just completely open. That wire is no longer connected. So that coil is burnt up or the wire is broke. So I'm going to go into it and see if I can find the wire broken, hopefully. Actually, I can't easily get into it because it's this is a sealed relay. Um, so there's one of the wires. Whoa, I went too far. I was so good, too. There we go. There's one of the wires. Doesn't appear to be broken. And then there's the other. Doesn't appear to be broken. So the wire's probably broken inside the coil somewhere. Or it's burned up. Um, yeah. So... There's a jumper thing, too, where there are different jumpers on here, depending on if they want the um, solenoids to be running off 25 or 50 volts. So, it's these little white ones here. W2, W1, W3, W4, W5. W6. So it's possible you could take one out of the, the wrong game and put it in there and then have the voltages all screwed up going to the different coils. So some of the coils are going to run off 50 and some of them are going to run off 25. It just depends on how you've got it set up. So I'll check and see if it's set up the way it's supposed to. Um, I don't know that I've got another one of these. I might. 24 volts DC. So all you really need is a 24 volt coil that has basically the same footprint. So it's a dual pole, uh, dual throw. Or do I have that wrong? Maybe it's, it's a dual pole, dual throw, but I can't remember if this is the throw or if these are two of the poles. Whatever. I might have one like that. Let me see if I can find one laying around that's a 24 volt. All right, so I have a Williams System 11 power supply here that has had serious problems, but it still has the relay on it, and the relay tests good, or at least the coil part does. The other part, I believe, will be fine. They used the same parts for years. I think it's the same as the flipper relay, even, on the earlier games. So this is what the measurement should look like, something more like that. So 658. Remember I said that if it was one point. 5k that might be possible so 659 ohms i guess is somewhere near what it is supposed to be on a healthy one so let me pull this off and we'll swap it in and hopefully that'll get our our c side back all right so i've got the replacement relay in there all the fuses are fine um we already checked that I, there are four capacitors on the board i just went ahead and replaced them the electrolytic capacitors um just as a preventative thing in this the way, the way they're used in this circuit, I don't think you really need to replace them, but I did it anyway. Um, and then I also reflowed all of the connectors all the way around it to make sure everything has a good connection. But, um, yeah, so the old relay, the coil, was burnt up somewhere. The new one doesn't appear to be, so let's try putting it back in and see if that gets our C side back. All right, we got it. That did it.
Telltale will see the knocker. It did the one, and then it only did it once. So it's all doing what it's supposed to. Do. Much better. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so next up I think we'll just check the switches. That should be an easy one. Usually you don't have switch problems like where you've got board problems with the switches. But sometimes, maybe this time since I just cursed it. Uh, so when I went into the switch test it was telling me that there were three switches on, which were the three trough switches. Which were the three balls that were down in the trough. So I ejected them and now we have no switches on. So if you go into switch levels it will basically tell you what switch is on if you hold the switch down. So the shooter lane is working. We're just going to see if everything works. Right return. Right out lane. Left return. Left out lane. Left lock. Three, which was the top one. Ooh, yeah, some weird ones. Okay, so over here... I guess you can lock all three balls here. So see that one will not be working. It's down too far. So I can push it down with something or so we'll at least know if that switch works. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to raise that up though so that the ball can actually hit it when it does it. So keep that one in mind. It needs fixed. And did we do these? I think we did. Okay. Uh, it's easy to miss one of these because there's just a ton of, like here's one, left ramp scope, so left ramp, that's correct, okay, Entering the left ramp, it worked there for a second. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Let me get a piece of paper. We're going to, have to write some of these down. Okay, so the top left jet works, but the other ones don't. Top right jet. Top lower jet. Look, folks, it's hard to do when you shake like this. Okay, um, spinner. The spinner ain't spinning, folks. I mean, it's spinning. Oh, there it is. Okay, let me try it again. All right, apparently it's all right. Uh, right loop, bottom. Right loop, top. Okay. Right ramp scope top, right ramp scope bottom. Inner loop. I don't want to hit the drop target yet because it'll knock it down. And then it'll do it over and over again. are doing its thing. Uh, what else do we have? I guess we got the drop targets. Oh, here's one. Okay. Uh, okay, drop targets. Top single drop, but it didn't drop very well, so we got to mess with that.
So see what I mean? It's going to keep doing that now. Now if you add a second switch, it will just go back and forth between both of them. So that's all right, I guess. M middle drops bottom. Middle drops middle and bottom. Middle drop top, middle, bottom. Okay, so all four of the drops work. This one just gets stuck. So we got to mess with that. Um, that's all the ones I see. We've also got the sensors down in the Down in here somewhere there will be some kind of sensor. Oh, and the there's probably one telling you that this is down. Right ramp down. Yep, okay. All right, so it looks like most of them are working. We've got a few little problem childs here. Let's see if we can work through those, and let's see if we can find the, if there's something for the seller the cellar door value, and I guess that's it. So these three coils here are the three top pop bumpers. You can see there's a little switch on each one. So I cleaned the switch on the two that weren't working, and they're now working. So um, I'll just do it from the bottom. That one was working. That one's working. And that one's working. So I got those, that was easy peasy. Um, this one over here, this middle one, is the one that just needs bent. So let's rearrange the playfield so we can get to that. So there are three switches there, and strangely enough, the brackets all bent up. I don't know how that happened. So it's one piece with the three switches on it, and they're just bent on a cramp. And there's a, oh I see, look. The wrong post is in it, or it missed where it's supposed to be, or something, and it's pushing it all out of the way. Maybe it's supposed to go through that hole or something. So the post has went down through, and it's pushing that down, which has bent it all up and made it where the second switch, although it works, just doesn't stick through the play field as much as it's supposed to. All right, so let me mess with that a little bit. All right, so I've bent it back flat, and now they are all up and where the ball will hit them. And then this one here was real touchy, the little hanging one there. And so basically there's a little bar over on the right that hits this switch. And if that switch blade isn't adjusted right, basically it'll that has to move too far to hit it and all of that. So let's test it. I think it's good. What do you think? I guess it depends on how fast you hit it. I think we're good. If it's not, we'll adjust it later, but it's much better. So that leaves us with uh, the top drop target was sticking, and that's it. So that drop target, it has a spring on the back of it that pulls it down. If it's dirty, though, sometimes it won't drop right. So let's see what happens. Yeah, that spring isn't really doing much. So that, the spring should pull it all the way down. So it slides and it's probably catching on the way down. If you look at these, so they drop really fast. So there's obviously something going on with the spring on that one. So this is the three-way one, right? And uh, what are they using? Little optics in there, I guess. Yeah. See the little optic up there? That's what's basically making it work. So the, the, it's actually working, it's just it's not dropping right. So this one, you can see the spring really well. It goes all the way down to the bottom. It's a really long spring, and it hooks in place about halfway up the drop target. But do you see that little spring-loaded clip thing there? The drop target has to ride down on that. So if that's dirty or messed up, it'll cause you problems. So that's the three-way one. This is the one-way one. It's in the absolute worst spot to see the other side of it, though. Um, so let me see if I can tell what's going on with it. 
All right, I think I've got that dropping really well. The spring was a little misplaced. Whenever I put it back exactly how it's supposed to go, it's like, like the other one now. So that's it for this video, folks. We'll work on uh, some more stuff next time. We've got to do the lamps. We obviously have to do the sound. Uh, we have to do some more cosmetic stuff. We have to put the flippers back on. We have to test play it. we got a lot left. All right, folks. So if you like uh, this vintage of game, we'd uh, one a little bit older than this, but just as fun, in my opinion, that we worked on a while back was William's Comet. So if you'd like to see a video on a Comet pinball machine, check it out there. We'll see you on next time when we'll come back and work on this whirlwind a little bit more, but uh, you can enjoy the comment until then. <laughs> Have a good evening.